Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here, and today we once again find ourselves in the Lord of the Rings universe, where one player takes the role of Frodo and his companions, who are journeying from the Shire to Rivendell, while up to four other players represent the Nazgul, who are trying to hunt down the hobbits. While traveling, Frodo and others must resist being corrupted by the ring that he wears. Hunt for the Ring is a game of hidden movement, deduction, and adventure by Ares Games. It's played in two parts, with each part being played on a different game board. Now, even though both parts can be played in a long evening of play, we suggest you play each part in a separate session. So today, we will be focusing on part two. So if you haven't yet played part one, you should watch that video first, and the link to that is in the description of this video just below me. So today we'll be doing a rule school, where I'll teach you how to set up and play the game so that you don't have to read the rule book yourself. Now I've placed timestamps below me in the description of this video, just in case you want to jump to a specific section of the rules. Well, let's get started. Part 2 of Hunt for the Ring has Frodo taking a predetermined route to Rivendell that you're able to select at the beginning of the game. You'll also be moving Gandalf secretly through the locations to help hinder the Nazgul from finding Frodo. But now the Ring Wraith players can summon the Lord of the Nazgul which gives them more powerful abilities throughout the game. Can Frodo get all the way to Rivendell through his predetermined route before having a certain amount of corruption? Well, you can help him out even more with Gandalf getting there first, allowing Frodo to withstand even more corruption. So if you've gotten to this part two, that means in part one, Frodo was not defeated. Congratulations so far. Now, if you're playing this in a single long evening, everyone stays the same roles and keep all the components in front of you. Now, I'm gonna go through how you distribute the new components, which ones to remove. However, if you are playing this in a separate session, if you remember at the end of your first session of part one, you'd placed many things in the envelope. You're gonna take all these things out of this envelope uh, and you're gonna distribute them to the correct players. However, if there are any sorcery cards that are in here, let the Ring Wraith players gather these cards so that the Ring Bearer player cannot see them, and the Ring Wraith players will then take these cards and distribute them any way they see fit throughout the different Nazgul players. There are some components in part two that you won't be using and you can remove them from this game and place them back in the box. First of all, the information tokens. Any of the information tokens that were not collected by the Ring Wraith players on the card will be removed and placed back in the box. Any green allied cards in the deck, so that entire deck that has not been used will go away along with the discarded cards. But if you have any of those cards in your hand, keep them near yourself as the Ring Bearer player will tell you what to do with any leftover cards of those from part one. The Frodo starting location tokens, any flipped company cards other than Frodo's card, and any discarded corruption tokens can all be removed. You'll then take the game board and place the side up for part two. The easiest way to tell is you look at the movement track and the background here should be orange, not green. You're gonna take the Frodo miniature and you're gonna place it on zero of the movement track. Next, on the right side of the board, you'll place the corruption marker at the exact level that the ring bearer had as they successfully got through part one. You'll also add any eye corruption tiles, including the Fear of the Barrow Whites card that's in possession of the ring bearer player and put that next to the corruption track. Next, the ring bearer player will set up their screen for part two. They'll be looking at the board in their small little screen here, and the easiest way to tell the orientation is to make sure that you have the orange closest to what you're looking at on either the left or right side on the inside of the shield. You'll then place your journey log side up that has the Gandalf character on it, and you'll also slide in a new sheet of paper so that you have a fresh sheet to be able to write on. Next, place any of the face-up company cards that you had from part one in front of you, then add the Meriadoc Brandybuck card, if it wasn't already there, and the Strider card face up like this. You'll also take the Gandalf the Grey Player Aid card, as well as the miniature for Gandalf. Next, you'll place any of the Fellowship tokens you had from Part 1 onto the Frodo Company card. Then you're going to set up the Fellowship Pool. If the Frodo card is not flipped, you'll have a total of three Fellowship tokens. If it is flipped, a total of two Fellowship tokens, and that includes any of them that are on the Frodo card. So in this case, since the Frodo card is not flipped, I'd have a total of three Fellowship Tokens, and since I already had one on the card, I'd place two in my pool. 
Next, you're going to locate some new cards for part two. They're called journey cards. You're going to separate these out into two decks. One deck is always going to have 14 in the upper left hand corner, and the other deck is always going to have 16 in the upper left hand corner. So all the cards in this deck have 16, all the cards in this deck have 14. Now once those decks have independently been shuffled, you'll draw one card from each of these decks, and you'll be able to choose which card you'd like to use. These journey cards show predetermined routes that Frodo will secretly be taken, and it's either going to be 14 movements, or 16 movements, with a certain amount of corruption it takes to lose in either case. Without the Ring Wraith players knowing, you're going to secretly select one of these cards, and you can place that journey card right in the spot matching the back of that card on your journey log. You'll also take the deck that that came from and keep it nearby as well face down. The card that you did not select will go back into the deck that that card came from and you'll remove this deck from the game, place it back in the box without allowing the Ring Wraith players to see which deck this is. If you remember, you set aside the cards that you still had from part one from the green ally cards. You're going to now discard these cards, but for each card that you've done this for, you are going to take one card from the new deck for part two. It is the orange ally cards. These will be shuffled into a deck and you'll draw one of these for each of the cards that you just discarded from the part one ally cards. Next, you'll find the Gandalf deed tokens. These are new for this part two. You're going to shuffle these up and you're going to draw four of these and then you'll have some decisions to make. One of them you'll select the place here. This is going to be your starting location for Gandalf. The other three will go in these Gandalf spots here, and these are locations that if you get to, will help you out thoroughly throughout the game, but we'll go over what they do later. The stack of the tokens that you did not use can be placed off to the side for now. The Ring Wraith players will take these four Nazgul miniatures and the corresponding cards and divide them up amongst the Ring Wraith players, just as in part one. You'll then give one of the Ring Wraith players the lead player token randomly. Next, take the Black Rider's reference card and place it where everyone can see it, and any of the information tokens that were on there from part one, place on there. Now, if you had all five information tokens on here, you'd be able to start this part two with the Lord of the Nazgul already in play, which means you'll take the black-based Lord of the Nazgul miniature and the special die that is this orangish color, and you'll add it to play. Now, this will essentially swap out one of the Nazgul from the lead player. If they have more than one, they get to decide which one that is. You'll also give that player the Lord of the Nazgul player aid. Give the Ring Wraith log tokens to the Ring Wraith players, and you've already divvied up any sorcery cards that were in the envelope from part one, but also take the sorcery deck and the discard pile from the box, returning them to play as they were at the end of part one. Next, you'll create the hunt pool. To do that, you'll take all the corruption tiles that were not drawn in part one. And to that, you will shuffle in the three gray corruption tiles, and that are specific for part two, so you have one stack. And keep in mind, you do not add back into this pool any of the corruption tiles that you already discarded and removed from the game from part one. Then, starting with the lead Ring Wraith player and going clockwise, each player will place one of their Nazguls in either location 33 or 28, and you can notice this little corruption icon to help you remember. There must be two Nazguls in each of these locations, and as you can see here, we're going to start with the Lord of the Nazgul in this game. Then you'll place the ring turn marker on the first day turn, and the lead ring wraith player will roll all six of the black dice. And since we're starting with the Lord of the Nazgul in play, that special die is also rolled as well. Remember, for each of the black die that has the shadow icon, that player will add one fellowship token from its pool to the Frodo card. However, if the special die for the Lord of the Nazgul has that shadow logo on it, they do not get a fellowship token. The object of the game for the Ring Bearer player is to get Frodo through a certain amount of movements to the end without corruption reaching or exceeding the corruption threshold, even though this amount can change depending on what happens throughout the game. And naturally, the Ring Wraith players are trying to corrupt Frodo enough so that it meets or exceeds the number here, which then again can be modified that we'll go over later. The turn structure is similar to part one, where there'll be two daylight turns and then a nightfall turn in one day. And the ring bearer player will be secretly moving Gandalf using the journey log, and they'll be trying to secretly get Frodo to his destination using the predetermined journey that was selected. The daylight turns work similar in flow, where the ring bearer player will go, and then each of the Nazgul players will go in any order, and then it will go to the next daylight turn. 
At the beginning of each daylight turn, the ring barrel player will move the Frodo character down one spot on the movement track. At this point, we're at one. And the ring bearer player is secretly tracking Frodo using the journey card that they selected. For example, at the start, Frodo started at number four, and at movement number one, it's a dot. Because on the next movement, they'll be at 11. So this is the way that Frodo is going on this predetermined route. So Frodo's current location can be found by matching where the Frodo figure is on the movement track with the appropriate row on the journey card. The ring bearer player will move Gandalf and they'll write that location in the next spot on their journey log. Now, they started at 22 in this case, so Gandalf is here. Now, when Gandalf moves, he never moves to a dot. He always moves to a connected location, meaning it's adjacent to another location, being directly joined by a path or a road, or if they are separated by only dots. So from 22, he could have moved to 25, or 21, or 15, or even down here to 31, or even down to 16, uh, and all these different places that they can reach. Gandalf can also remain in the same location by recording the same number again as a location is connected to itself. In this case, let's say that he moved down to 15. Much like in part one, you would simply just write it in your journey log in the next space. And just like in part one, regardless if it's a daylight turn or a nightfall turn, you may play one ally card and spend a fellowship token to draw one card, and these can be done in any order. After the ring bearer player takes their daylight turn, each of the Nazgûls get to take their turn, and then a possible encounter will happen, just like in part one. The encounters work the same way, but there are different ways that Frodo handles the escape, which we'll go over later. The next daylight turn will work the same way. Now there is a slight difference to the nightfall turn. Now at this point, we'd be just going to the nightfall turn, so Frodo would have already have moved through two movements. And during the nightfall turn, Frodo can either move and decide to move this down to the third one, or they can decide to rest exactly as in part one. In this case, let's just say he does move. And keep in mind that moving Frodo at night has the same consequences as in part one, meaning you advance the corruption marker by one on the corruption track, and the turn marker is flipped to the eye side to remind the ring race players that for the length of the nightfall turn, they will get a free hunt instead of a search. And if you remember, Gandalf is moving on every turn. Even on a nightfall turn, if Frodo decides to rest and not move, Gandalf will still move. So in this case, Gandalf went from 15, then he went down to 16, and then he came to 31 over here. And much like part one, after the ring bearer player has done their move in the nightfall turn, each of the Nazgûls would get to do theirs as well. And then it possible an encounter would happen, and then you'd refresh just as in part one, and then this would move back. So that flow is very similar to part one. Now, one of the things Gandalf can do is complete a deed. If you remember, these three numbers were selected as deeds at the beginning of the game. Let's say Gandalf got to location number 18. Gandalf may optionally take this token and reveal it face up next to the corruption track so the Ring Wraith players know that Gandalf is in location 18, but you don't put his figure on the board or anything like that at this point. What this does is the corruption maximum that Frodo can have is actually increased by one. Like right now, it's at 10. So the journey card at the beginning of the game was selected was 12, which means now it's to 13 because we were able to add one. So Frodo, if they get to 13 or higher of corruption, would then lose the game. Now, if Gandalf ever moves to Rivendell, at that point, Gandalf may optionally place the figure on Rivendell, and that adds an additional one to the total amount of corruption that Frodo can have. And it doesn't necessarily have to be this exit. It actually could be any three of these exits, but he basically places his marker out there and essentially he's in Rivendell, regardless of to which one of these he's actually in. But at that point, Gandalf is out of play for the rest of the game. After moving to a location that has one or more Nazgul on it, Gandalf can reveal himself. In order to do so, he must spend one fellowship token from Frodo's card and remove it from the game for good. Then he moves all the Nazgul there up to two spaces away. Now these can be one, two, one, two differently, or they could be the same, it does not matter. Then Gandalf will reveal himself on the location that he just moved to. Then the ring bearer player can take any one of the standard dice, not the Lord of the Nazgul's dice, and they can remove it from the dice pool for now. It'll come back to the dice pool in the next refresh phase. In the ring race turn, just after Gandalf has been placed on the board, the Nazgul cannot enter or move through that specific location, and they cannot be targeted by any search or hunt, even when playing sorcery cards. Once all the ring wraiths are done with their turns, the Gandalf figure is removed from the board. Then he will randomly draw two deeds tokens from the supply, 
place them behind his shield, and he'll pick one of these to be his new current location, let's say 34. He would write this in this next open spot in his journey log. He would discard this out of play so the other players don't get to see what it is. This one will get put back with the other tokens. Now Gandalf also changes the way that perception is done. Let's say this Nazgul is here, and they want to do a perception of either an area or section. Now when they ask about that, if either Frodo or Gandalf is in that area or section, whichever one they've specified, then the answer is just yes. So if they get a yes answer, they don't know if it's Gandalf or Frodo or both. Now searching acts a little differently as well in this part too. Let's say this Nazgul is on location 21 and we're at the movement track of four and this Nazgul does a search at 21. So if we look at the fourth movement of Frodo, Frodo is sitting at 21. So in this case, that player would say yes and the Nazgul player would place a track token like normal. But since anything before this Frodo's also been to, if that Nazgul was on space 11 or four and did a search, then this player would still say yes because Frodo has been through that. However, Gandalf can never be found in searches because he never leaves tracks. So even if any of the numbers, including the place that he actually is in his last location, is the number that they're searching, the answer is always no if it's just Gandalf and if Frodo was not ever in that location. Now if that Nazgul in location 21 decided to do a hunt instead of a search, and in this case, yes, Frodo is actually there in the last location, then an encounter would ensue after all the other Nazgul have had a turn this round. Now how an encounter works in part two is similar to part one. However, when Frodo escapes, it works a little bit differently. When Frodo escapes, basically he can choose one of two things. One is to keep the current journey card and position and to resume playing normally. Now this is usually a good option if Frodo is about to reach one of the exit locations. The other option is for Frodo to move back one on the movement track and then change course by getting a new journey card. In this case, any track tokens that might be on the board are removed because now we're getting a new card and new movement. Then you discard this card without the Ring Wraith player seeing what it is, and you would take a new card from the deck that you left to the side of you at the beginning of the game. Notice it's the same length because you're using that same deck, and now you have your new movement path. Also keep in mind if your Strider card is face up and not flipped, then you can use its ability to essentially draw two new journey cards and keep one instead of just keeping the first one. Now if when hunting, that location happens to be Gandalf's last location, then Gandalf is forced to flee. He would take a token off the top of the deed token stack and secretly look at it. He would write this in the next spot to the right on his journey log, and this is his new location. He would then discard this without letting anyone else see it. Keep in mind, the same hunt can find both Frodo and Gandalf if they are both in the same location. As shown previously, Gandalf would flee, a track token would be placed, and a Nazgul encounter begins. Now we already talked about how the Lord of the Nazgul comes into play at the beginning of the game, and that was if all five of these information tokens were filled up back in part one. However, if this was not the case, the other way to bring him in is by using a sorcery card called Captain of the Nine, where it says part two, you'd replace that active player's Nazgul with the Lord of the Nazgul, and you'd also bring this dice into play at the next refresh phase. Now since the Lord of the Nazgul is in play, let's go over this special die. Now on this die, it has three sides that are consistent with the dice that you already know about, but it has three new sides that we'll talk about now. Now when this die is used, it doesn't have to be used by the Lord of the Nazgul player. It can be used by any Ring Wraith player. This is the Morgul Ring, and it allows you to perform a perception in the area or the section that the active Nazgul is located. And if that perception is successful, the ring bearer player must specify who's inside the area, either Frodo, Gandalf, or both. And this is different from the normal perception, which is just yes or no. This allows them to force them to tell them who it is. The Seek die allows you to move all the Nazgul one step, starting with the active Nazgul. Now this is the Morgul Shadow. Now this allows you to use this die as either a sorcery, a sword, or a ring, and those happen to be the three other actions on this dice that aren't the new ones that we're talking about now. Now even though this has a shadow on it, the Ring Barrel player cannot get a Fellowship token when this is rolled. Now on the Lord of the Nazgul's turn, before or after moving they can spend an action die like normal, or they can perform a hunt in its location without using a die. Now if the Lord of the Nazgul is involved in a hunt and an encounter ensues, You'll draw two corruption tiles instead of just one. And remember in part two, some of these gray tiles might be the ones drawn, which are worth three. Then after that encounter, that Lord of the Nazgul will be replaced by that player's normal Nazgul. 
And since the Lord of the Nazgul is out of play, then its die is removed out of play at the end of the current day. Keep in mind, the Lord of the Nazgul can subsequently return to play through the Captain of the Nine sorcery card. Now the game will end in one of two ways. Either Frodo will get all the way to the end of his secret journey card, and if so, the ring bearer player wins. However, if the corruption ever gets to the level of this or higher, which can be modified as we showed before by some of the deed tokens, like in this case, it's 12 plus one is 13, and if it either meets or exceeds this, then the ring wraith players have corrupted the ring bearers and they have won. If you find winning the game as the ring bearer player too difficult, you can include this variant to make it a little easier. It's called shelters. Using the longer of the two types of journey cards, the ones that go to 16 movements, you'll notice round circles to the right of some of the named locations. These are shelters. Unbeknownst to the Ring Wraith players, if Frodo's last location is marked by one of those shelters, then the Nazgul can find Frodo only by performing a hunt, and a search always fails. However, if those sheltered locations are not Frodo's last locations, then a search succeeds in finding Frodo's passage and a track token is placed as normal. Well, I hope this helped you dive right into part two of Hunt for the Ring and get to the fun quicker than you normally would if you had to read the rulebook yourself. Now, if you have further questions about the rules, I've placed a link below me in the description of this video, and that's the best place to ask them, because not only will I be notified, but so will Ares Games.